Okay, we are back. So, um, hello. Oh my God, it freeze it just now. <laughs> okay, okay we people, back. we were seeing you, but now the image is freeze it. So, yeah. People, we are seeing you, but now what? the image is freezing. Now it, uh, the so. image transmission stopped. Yeah, it is freezing. But can you, they hear you? Or uh, you don't know? Uh, now uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, colleagues, so it seems we sort of joining together, at least mentally we are together, <laughs> psychologically also close. And uh, uh, what else? They are back. Uh, ah, they're back. And they can hear you or me, or what is happening? Yeah. Hello, colleagues. I don't know, where should I wave? <laughs> there. Oh, here? No, we, we don't have camera here. It's just there. So, um, hello, people, say hello, please. Hello, colleagues. Could you raise your hand? <laughs> ah, good. So, uh, colleagues, uh, we decided to connect to you. Can you hear me? I'm Dimitri Solomatin. We can hear you, but we cannot see. Ah, good. So, uh, cannot please, see. Uh, we decided to connect to you. Can you hear me? YouTube audio. Uh -huh. So, uh, okay, we, okay, so we have tried. At least we want to show you that we exist. It's not fake. And now we know you exist. So you are real. We're happy to see you. And thank you for attending this course. Uh -huh. Good. Thank you. Okay, so... At least we want to show you that we exist, it's not fake, and now we know you exist. Say something. What are they saying? They're all good? Right. Anyway, I think it's an important moment when... Can you see everybody and they cannot see us, no? They are seeing us in the... What are they saying? They're all good? Okay, good. So then we'll continue, and we know you are there, you know uh, anyway, we are here, and your names are in the list of attendants, yes. right? Okay, good. So in case of questions, uh, please address them as you did yesterday. Okay. We're happy to answer them. So then we'll continue, and we know you are there, you know uh, we are here, oh, and me. your names are in the list of attendants, right? Okay, good. So in case of questions, uh, please address them as you did yesterday. We're happy to answer them. Okay, good. If you see me. We keep in touch in chats, yes. Okay, okay we have to move on. Right, so colleagues, what we'll do now is this. Uh, to remind you what we did with the hydrological model. Go back to the folder with the tank X model. So we now make a step back to recall what was that model doing. Just like this, start it. Okay. And I, without calibration, run this model. By default, it will use some values which are not terribly optimal. Okay, it gives some result and error is 12.6, as you can see here, okay? What we'll do now, we will calibrate this model using globe, using randomized search in the space of eight parameters. So it will be a search in eight dimensional space. Every time running the model for calculation of the function, you have to run the model and calculate error. And we'll be trying to minimize this error, okay? So let's go back to globe. And I would suggest close globe and start it again, because there could be a bug related to saving files. Just go to globe again and start it again. In the folder called globe, okay? Now click open existing project, and you will see there is a project in demos called tank S6. You see it? 
Yes? It's in the folder demos, so open it. Now click please set parameters. And what you see here, option number two in functions to optimize is seared rainfall runoff model. This is uh, Sugawara Aichi rainfall tank model, rainfall runoff tank model. So it's the model we use in another software. Exactly the same code used here. It's just hard-coded into Globe for speed. We use the same cal calibration parameters, same variables parameters, and so on. So it's exactly the same model as we were running in TechSexia. It's just implemented inside Globe. So let's choose algorithms to run. Well, we could run all of them if you want. It will be sequence of many algorithms run together and then in principle you can compare which one was the best and so on because everything is saved in the result file. You can then analyze it later, okay? But it's very fast so it takes uh, one second or more, or not more. It was 6.9. Yes? 5.9, sorry, 5.9, yes, that's true. So 5.9 was the best manual calibration. Now we try to beat it using the tool. So what you will see now is very fast movie. We could rerun it again and make it slower if you want, but now if you click start optimization, you will see that uh, eight, nine algorithm running after each other, and all of them showing different pictures in these six windows. So what is these six windows? Uh, you will see is projections of the space x1, x2, x2, x3, x3, x4, and so on. So let's start. Done? Same thing? Okay, so again, what we see in these windows? You have eight-dimensional space. Here it's projected on several planes, x1, x2, x2, x3, and so on. And these points you see there are, in fact, model runs uh, shown uh, in these uh, windows. A x8 you don't see because uh, I don't have more space to show, so it's unfortunate. But you can choose windows which to show in the settings. You can choose what planes to project to, maximum six. So you see all the algorithms were run. And you can, if you click on them, you can see uh, best. No, you don't see the best results. You see them here. So look, last uh, in history window down down in the screen, you see the results, function value, uh, and algorithm, and number of function evaluations. So which was the fastest? A call actually. It's a version of a call with local search was fastest. Seven hundred forty-eight evaluations. And the most accurate was algorithm called controlled random search, which is yet another algorithm. It found value 5.68. It's marginally better than a call, actually, and then Maltese. Uh, all values are very close. GA is slightly higher, but not much. So 5.68 is the best value found. 59, so it's better than mine. Yeah, with Maltese. Excellent result. So I'm sure your PhD defense now would be at a higher level because you can be praised for finding better value. So you see, real scientists. Huh? It's not for nothing. To no, it depends on your knowledge of everything uh, after PhD. <laughs> so God knows uh, which random searches uh, to give to whom the best. And do you have any, anybody has better values than 5.68? Yeah, 5.59? Good. So you also would have wonderful research career in front of you. So, uh, we could uh, run this, you could yourself run these algorithms uh, separately. Let's do it quickly uh, now. So if you go to set parameters,
So if you go slightly up from this table, scroll up, solution found by the fastest algorithm, a call, and you see this vector, these are decision variables. Here. This is the function value, and this vector is decision variables. It's in this window. But if you go to folder, globe, with the, this model, you will see that there is a new file appeared, which was not there originally, called gpin. So go to your folder, sort on date of creation, and you will see this folder uh, file gpin, 120 bytes long. <coughs> if you look into it, you will see it contains eight numbers. This is the optimal vector. So there were many vectors generated, 700 times. But last one, optimal, the best, was saved on top of everything, and it's called gpin, and it has this optimal uh, vector of uh, parameters, eight parameters, okay? So what we'll do now, please rename it, this gpin in the folder uh, with the demos for globe into something like g my best, like I did, rename it. Don't change pin because pin we need. G my best so that we know this is new best vector. And we'll now move it to the folder with tankexe model and read it into tankexe and see what happens. It's cumbersome a bit, but why not? So I say control C on it. I go to tankexe folder. And I say control V. So now in my tankexe folder, I have this file over here. It could have been also in that folder, no problem. We can open it from any folder, but I like it to have it in one place. Always nice to see all of these files. So in this, we have gpin, which is old, which is non-optimal in tankexe, and gpin my best is uh, the new vector of, uh, vector of solution. So you see old one looks like this, Okay, eight numbers, and the new one looks like this. Some other numbers. So what we do now, we go back to tank X, and there is a button, read from file. You see parameters. We can type them in yourself if you want, but it's easier to read, and you can see this my best file now in this folder. But you can jump, jump, navigate to another folder if you want. So open it. You see these numbers changed to something else here. Because the program always takes file uh, numbers which are here. You can change them as well by hand. And then when you click run, it will take it them from the screen. So this is old output. Error was 12.6. And now if we run, this is the new output, which is in your presentation as well. Error is 5.68. In your case, it's 5.59. But plot is not distinguishable because it's the same plot. So what we demonstrated. So we applied randomized search algorithms, many of them. OK, you could have been one. To find optimal value of uh, decision variable vector, which gives you minimum possible function value. You cannot make this model better. Whatever you do, it will not show a better result, whatever you do. So model is not good enough simply to reproduce this part of hydrograph. But here it's quite good. Why it is not good enough? I don't know. But the model is too simple. It has not enough parameters. It's too simple to reproduce whatever you like. Maybe data was bad, by the way. Look, this model tries to push rainfall through the catchment to flow. Right? And if there is not enough rainfall to reach that level, it will never be able to generate it. So perhaps that data was bad. That data reflects too much flow if compared to the uh, observed rainfall. You see, this rainfall doesn't give you enough water to reach the black line simply. That's it. You cannot generate it. 
So that's perhaps possible explanation of why error is not approaching zero. <coughs> A bit, but not much. Look, here it's not in advance, it's vice versa, it's, uh, it's behind. Hmm? So here it's slightly behind, here it's, uh, here it's almost the same, so okay. Here it's a, a bit ahead. But again, black line is not accurate data, obviously, so that's what you can conclude from this. shifted. <coughs> so you see what may happen that uh, you may generate different uh, vectors which would give you a similar value of the error but vectors would be different. So it means error function in eight dimensional space have multiple local minima. So we may end up with one minimum and there would be another one and another one. Let's compare these values. Are they very different from mine? Say D1, 263. Is it different in your case? Could be very different. 488, see how different they are. And still, all these combinations give you similar value of the error. So it means error function is a bit flat, and it has m multiple, multiple local minima. We actually investigated this error function. It looks terrible, you know, it's, it's like this. So which one to choose? Nobody knows. You have to use your engineering judgment, hydrological knowledge, and choose values here which would be more reasonable, even if they lead to higher error. So don't trust blindly to optimization tool. It's blind, it doesn't know anything about hydrology. Use your judgment to choose uh, the values uh, here which would be more physical, okay? So for example, this case, K105, 024, 041, 022. Okay, it looks reasonable. Somewhere in the middle of the range. It's okay. You have similar values of K. So maybe it's most important. So, questions about this. So, to conclude, what we did. We first manually calibrated this model. Then, uh, manual calibration led actually to quite low values. Not bad, but simple model. For more complex model, it's better to use automatic calibration tools that would give you much lower error, perhaps. But you have to be careful looking at what it would generate here at these parameters. If they're non-physical, don't use them. Try to move them to physical area even if you increase the error. So perhaps you're trying to fit the model to the wrong data. And data is always, not always, but very often data is quite uncertain. Right? Okay, good. So, you can save uh, this, uh, if you play with these parameters here, then you can save them to file, you know, all this stuff. So these uh, functions are here. If you want to, I just want to remind you, virtual tank view, you can then run it. And you animate, it's a bit yellow here, you cannot see much. But okay, you can play with this model and you can use it maybe for education as well, if you want. All right, enough about this model. We go back now to the presentation. So the global optimization tool, we discussed this. Okay, we discussed all this already, so I just want to repeat you the file with parameter values that Globe generates over here is this gpin, and the file with the best values called grsp, you can also find it in that folder of Globe, and this model is tankexia model, which is run here. Now, how do we assess uh, optimization algorithms? First is effectiveness. So please note, effectiveness and efficiency are different things. Effectiveness is uh, 
how good this algorithm is in terms of solving its main problem. And its main problem is finding the minimum value. So how close this minimum to a real uh, minimum? That's the first one to uh, check. Second, efficiency. So effectiveness is how good algorithm is. E efficiency is how fast it is, how efficient it is. Important, as I said, for complex models, you may need hundreds of thousands of runs, so you don't want to wait for too long. Also important thing. And the third one is reliability or robustness. <coughs> it means that how uh, good this algorithm would be if something changes in the conditions or in your random generation of points and whatever. If algorithm every time gives different results, then it's not terribly reliable. So you have to run it several times. It takes a lot of time. But if algorithm still gives you similar results, then it means it's reliable, it's good. But random search algorithms for complex function surfaces are unreliable because they generate a limited number of points. And uh, hence, you, try you have to try to run them several times. Let's assess, by the way, uh, how many uh, points you need to generate to cover the whole space of search, search space. So imagine you have eight dimensional space, eight parameters, okay? So you have eight parameters. So x1 and so on, x10, x8, sorry, okay? And imagine you want to uh, generate uh, the grid of points which has two values for each of the independent variables. So what you want to do is to have two values, for example, this value and this one at the range. If x1 has this range, I want to generate one point here, one point here. So two for each. So how many points in total would I need to generate to do it? It's two by two by two by two by two. So it's two to the power eight, which is two to the power 10, 1024. It's 256. So if you want to do it like this, so you know, to cover space like this, so generate grid like this, you know, uh, this in, in, in multiple dimensions, grid like this, with only two values for each, you need 256 evaluations. If you want to have three points here for each, you need three to the power eight, which is much higher number, much higher. So I realize for exhaustive search across large dimensional, high dimensional spaces, you need a lot of evaluations. So these algorithms, if it runs only 1,000 times, it will hardly cover space a bit. So you miss a lot of areas in this space where you have no, never been. So that's why rare randomization gives you different results. You generate new points. And that's why you need to run random search algorithms for a long, long time to cover space. It's inevitable. Okay, please understand this. So this evaluation helps to understand how many model runs you need. So you need thousands of runs to cover space, more or less. All right. So, okay, that was a plot from an old paper where I, for this model, compared algorithms. So look, this is effectiveness, function value. We want to reach low value, which was 5.6, uh, right? And this is number of function evaluations. So want to have it small. So in fact, ideal algorithm would be going like this and stop here somewhere with very small number of evaluations. These algorithms behave more or less in a similar fashion. So this is GA, green, not bad, but blue one was better, ACO, so I was quite happy to do it, and I didn't do much to push it, you know. I, of course, you can tune algorithms sometimes to perform better than others, but okay, all of them were not bad, but interestingly, one algorithm was multi multis, uh, was running, running, long, 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 and then suddenly it found the solution, so that's interesting. Uh, and multi-start simplex, 
was quite good. You see, it went down and then it took some time. So, right. Too cold. It's a big air conditioning. Or oh, what? It leaks. Water, it's water. What a problem. Too many people for too long. We, sh we should stop soon. We're breathing too much. Don't breathe. <laughs> okay, you said you did multi criterial optimization. And no? You don't. Okay, so let's talk about this. In water sector, in any sector in life, you have to take into account many conflicting interests. So your problem is multi-objective or multi-criterial, which is the same. So again, we are trying to minimize several functions, okay? So, but minimizing one means you are not, doesn't mean you are minimizing another one. That's a problem. Like, if you want to be rich and healthy, often you, if you're either rich or healthy, or none of this, mostly, actually. So that's multi-objective uh, problem. Your uh, power generation. You generate enough power, but people stay without water because all water released downstream through the turbine. So, so that's unfortunate. So that's example. You say power vs. irrigation vs. navigability vs. Uh, power uh, water supply, so, and so on and so on. Pipe network optimization costs. Always a fi factor that you want to minimize, but if you minimize cost, you do best is zero cost, do nothing, but then you don't solve your problem. If you invest one euro, uh, you also solve nothing, and so on. So the, the, this is most important cost against eff effectiveness, and that's what uh, we do. Right. So now let's uh, concentrate. So these are decision variables: x1, x. N, it could be, for example, the releases of reservoirs from reservoir. And imagine we generated this many alternatives somehow. After optimization, you have them, or randomly, whatever. You have some alternatives. So in total, we generated four plus four, ten alternative solutions. So each of them is a vector of N uh, real values. Okay, so 10 alternative solutions of a certain optimization problem. Which one to choose? Well, we have to evaluate them with respect to objective functions. So imagine we have two objective functions, and both of them we want to minimize. So we calculate objective function 1 and 2 for this solution, and we draw a line uh, point here. And then we take this solution and uh, put a point here, and these values are values of objective function, and so on. So we do it 10 times. So 10 solutions are evaluated, and you have, in a different space, in two-dimensional space of objective functions, you have 10 points, like this. So the question is, which one to choose? So this solution is the best with respect to objective function 2, minimum, but here it's very bad. And this one is good with uh, uh, respect to first function and bad with respect to second function and this is somehow a compromise. And what about these solutions here? Should you look at them? No, why not? So we say these solutions dominate these ones. So it means for each of this cloud, for each of this point in this cloud, there is at least one solution which is better than this, <coughs> with respect to both objective functions. Not one, but both. <coughs> so this is called Pareto set, named after Italian economist of 19th century. And this solution is defined in the following fashion, that f for each of these solutions, there is no other solution that is better than this one with respect to both objective functions. So for this one, do we have 
better solution? Yes, this one, for this one, this and this and this. So all of this you will see could be discarded because there is no sense of looking at them. So this is called Pareto Optimal Set, like this. And these solutions could be presented to the decision maker to make a judgment, which one to implement, because you cannot implement five. There are five of them, which one to implement, you have to decide. So, this is multi-objective optimization, and it doesn't result in one solution, it results in a set of solutions. So there is no decision made yet. So please understand that multi-objective optimization doesn't lead you to the final solution yet. It doesn't. Okay, so that's the full thing. So this could be a compromise solution. Why it is a compromise? Because, okay, tell me why this solution maybe will be chosen. Why is that? Or which one would you, would you choose? Do you have enough information here? I think not, because you need other information to choose from this. Imagine this is cost and this is flood damage. So you should think how much money you have. So this one is expensive and not bad. This one is much more expensive but not much flood damage. And this one is cheap but a lot of flood damage. So you have to look at your budgets, you have to think to talk to people and all this. A lot of things to take into account uh, until you make your judgment. But also you can say if this is equally important, again, if, if these two are equally important, then you want to find the solution which is closest to ideal point. Why it is called ideal? Because this is minimum cost and minimum flood damage. This solution doesn't exist. It's ideal point. So sometimes it's called method of ideal point when we choose solution which is closest to it. So it means it's a compromise. If you know you will be making judgment like this in the end, and then there is no need to do multi-objective optimization. You combine these two objective functions into one and solve single objective optimization problem and you will end up with this solution because you will be minimizing this distance. So let's look. Uh, no, no, let me skip this. I want to discuss how to move from uh, the Pareto set to a single solution. So Pareto set is nice to give to decision makers, let them uh, make a judgment, but if you want to help them, you could help. First method is waiting method. You give weights to these two objective functions, the here denoted Z1, Z2, sorry for that, and then you optimize single objective function. So if this uh, weights, you know how to choose the weights, then you solve single objective optimization problem and you're done. Not a big problem. Problem is how to choose weights. What is the relative uh, judgment of this objective function? Second method, method of ideal point. Square root of square distances, so it's a distance, so it's this distance. It's almost the same as this one, as you see. Well, similar formula, simply it's squared and then square root. Okay, so results would be almost the same in these cases, as you see. So maybe if you put weights here, it would be even closer to this. Disadvantage, data must be normalized. Okay, it's not really disadvantage, but one is compensated by another in both cases. So for example, if this is high and this is low, and this is low, this is high, it would be the same uh, total value, but if this is what you want, it's not clear. Third thing is maybe uh, widely used, the most widely used method, constraint method. What you do is this. Imagine this is cost, and this is flood damage for your infrastructural solution for urban water management. What you could say is this. Look, guys, I mean, I have that much money not more. If you offer me these solutions which lead to lower flood damage, I cannot implement them. There is no money for it. So I will discard them. If it costs less, I don't care. I have the money to spend. 
So then we simply draw a line here. You put this into a constraint and you make single objective optimization problem immediately. So you put one objective function to constraint. So if this is if, if solutions have values here, discard them, not good. If solutions have value of cost here, accept them. Doesn't matter how much it costs. And then single objective optimization problem, you compare three alternatives. This one, uh, a lot of flood damage, medium, less, you choose this. It costs more, but you don't care because you have this money. That's it. So that's what human, humans typically do. They try to push uh, the objective functions, some of them, into constraints and solve simpler problem here. Question is, if, if, is it useful still to have this Pareto set? Very useful. Because even here, this decision maker may say, ah, look, I discarded first this solution because it's too expensive. But I need only a small fraction of money. Actually, if I press somebody, they would give me money to implement this one because I can show it's better than this red. You know, so it makes more flexible decision making and it pushes you to find maybe some other alternative uh, solution. So such constraints are called soft constraints, which can be slightly moved left or right. And in life you have many of these soft constraints, you know. For example, you want to go to, to a movie and expensive ticket and then say, okay, maybe then I don't go to the movie next week, I go to a better movie this week, I use all my money and next week we'll see how it goes, you know. So something like this. Questions? All clear? Excellent. Question? The break? 12.15? Good. The break for lunch? Excellent. So then uh, we make uh, no, no Pareto set, single objective optimization. If you're hungry, you want to eat. So how much longer should we work? zero minutes because we have to eat. Thank you very much for your attention. We convene at 2 o'clock. Good. Colleagues, thank you for your attention. Thank you for not sleeping during these lectures. So we will hope to finish optimization. Then we should move to uh, data-driven modeling. <coughs> and then since we go faster than I expected because you know so much, uh, maybe we'll have extra lecture on uncertainty analysis in the end, if we have. Ah, you like it? Then, yeah. Okay. So I think we have. To, so we have tomorrow three lectures with some seminar, and also Friday. Is it not? Two lectures Friday. Uh, student seminar, but we can use this time maybe for uncertainty analysis. There is something to discuss there. Okay, good, good. Yes, okay, fine. Great. <laughs>